Excellent. So we've got five uh, medical students co-presenting with me, Chiara, Isaac, Jonathan, Catherine and Aisha. And um, we're just going to do a very uh, quick blitz through uh, three very short presentations. Um, I'll just do a quick introduction and then it'll be over to Kasia and Aisha, who've done a recent needs assessment looking at health needs of people that are homeless, including those who are homeless with drug and alcohol issues uh, in the current situation. And then uh, Chiara, Isaac and Jonathan will then just talk us through a, a really exciting development that they've been involved with at Edinburgh University in setting up the UK's first student society of inclusion health. Uh, and that very much has its, um, its roots in, well it predates COVID, but the real impetus for developing that has been through COVID with medical students playing a key role volunteering here in Edinburgh. Uh, particularly working with people with drug issues in terms of delivering methadone, delivering other prescriptions, um, and also being actively involved in outreach clinics. And that was some of the newly qualified sort of medical students who were fast tracked onto the medical register uh, back uh, earlier in the year. So I'll just say a very quick uh, couple of things. So I'm, I'm a GP, I'm working with people that are homeless in homelessness in Edinburgh for the access practice. And when COVID hit uh, earlier this year, and when we really started to mobilize in terms of how we'd respond to try and keep health services open for people that were experiencing homelessness, that was really sort of middle of March. And these for me were the key areas that we were able to collaborate. And I think that's the key, key learning for me was the, the importance of collaboration as a response to a crisis situation. And I think that goes way beyond COVID actually, that we really need to build on that between uh, both health and the third sector, um, but also housing and public health um, and uh, social work as well, in fact. So we were involved in uh, when emergency accommodation was set up in the hotels to get people from rough sleeping into safe accommodation to enable them to keep themselves safe in terms of uh, social distancing and also for uh, general um, provision of shelter and food. As a practice, we identified our 240 most at risk patients uh, and those many of whom have uh, addiction issues uh, along with chronic uh, physical health problems um, and we were supporting them to self-isolate in terms of food deliveries and provision of other deliveries such as methadone and that's what the uh, medical students were involved in helping delivering and then I think a real really important aspect of our response was the recognition that if we're going to help people to stay safe we've actually got to go to where people are we shouldn't be asking people to congregate centrally into places they wouldn't normally be but we should be going to them to preventing the mixing of folk from across the city and risk of transmission and if we were asking people to actually uh, maintain themselves in accommodation then we really have to support them to do that so if they have an active addiction issue whether it's drugs or alcohol then we may need to be alongside them to support them and enable them to keep themselves safe and maintained in that accommodation and that meant uh, for those who are opioid dependents we needed to make available fast tracking onto opiate substitute treatment and that might be methadone or buprenorphine and I can maybe say a little bit about that later. One of the really exciting initiatives we were involved with was setting up an intermediary care unit, which is still running at Milestone House. And I'll, I'll, when I get my little turn a bit later, I'll say a bit more than that. And that's very much about freeing up hospital capacity by enabling people to be discharged, who have multiple complex needs, often around drugs and alcohol problems, uh, but who are also homeless. And uh, so then being discharged early from hospital into a, a, a safe caring environment. And then the students will talk a little bit, a bit more about the volunteering and educational aspects uh, that we were involved with. So without more ado, uh, Aisha and Kasia. So hi, um, thank you so much for the introduction, John, and thank you for having us along today. My name is Kasia Franchak and I'm a medical student at the University of Glasgow and I've been working on a project along with Aisha Chima, my colleague. So we've been working over the past few weeks um, with the Edinburgh Access Practice to evaluate their services and to have a look at how access to health services has changed for people experiencing homelessness in Edinburgh during the COVID-19 pandemic. 
So in order to do this, we carried out um, 25 semi-structured interviews with people who were experiencing homelessness and homelessness providers in and around Edinburgh over the course of three weeks at seven different sites. We tried to go and speak to people at sites that had different levels of involvement with the Edinburgh Access Practice to see how access had changed and how that varied between site to site. So we're going to talk briefly about like some of our findings. So one of the things we found was that in some cases there have been improvements in access to healthcare and this has been partly due to the increased outreach that's been um, focused on by the Edinburgh Access Practice. There's been, as John's already mentioned, a real effort to try and go meet people in the community where they're at. Um, and this has involved a GP clinic, a CPN clinic, and also a practice nurse clinic going into some of the emergency and temporary accommodation. Um, early on, NHS NOMI was identified as a facility for providing mental health consultations to people in accommodation, and this has been really well received by a lot of people using it, including um, some of the service providers. Improved interagency work was flagged up by both service users and service providers as one of the big improvements that's been seen during COVID. Um, and equally, same day starts for opioid substitute therapy was flagged by both service users and service providers as another thing that's improved during the pandemic. So I'm Maisha, and thanks for having me. So I'm just going to talk a bit about the barriers that were to discuss during interviews. So um, some people noticed that there was disparity in access between different sites. So we noticed this especially in hostels a bit further out in the from the city centre, where perhaps Edinburgh Access Practice didn't have as many outreach clinics and links with. Um, there was also a lack of knowledge among service users about the services that were available to them. Um, People also um, discussed that they sometimes had difficulty making appointments. They found it quite confusing talking over the phone to make an appointment. Um, they were used to coming in face to face to make those. And some people found it quite stressful waiting outside um, due to the reduced capacity within the clinic. Um, um, some people said that they appreciated the video appointments, but others um, found them quite difficult to navigate. Um, this included service users who didn't have access to a phone or a laptop or didn't have good Wi-Fi. And also some people didn't feel confident enough using a laptop to set up, a, for example, a virtual NHS near me um, CPN consultation. Um, in some sites, third sector staff helped set up these appointments to get around that barrier, but that wasn't the case in all sites. Um, some people also noticed that there was a bit of an emotional barrier when talking about especially mental health um, needs over the phone. They found that they weren't um, comfortable discussing personal issues over the phone with um, healthcare providers. Um, so some of the recommendations that um, the service users and service providers suggested moving forward um, was generally everyone felt that increased outreach would be really beneficial, especially to sites that currently aren't that linked in with Enver Access Practice. So for example, um, Spring Gardens Hostel and um, Almond Lodge House, a bit further out from the city, both noticed that um, having outreach, either a nurse or a CPN or a GP going out to them would be beneficial. Um, some trauma-informed training for all staff who come in contact with service users, including reception staff, um, would also be beneficial. Um, quite a few people relayed um, negative experiences with health services throughout their entire lives, which often discouraged them from seeking help in the future. Um, providing access to laptops, phones and ensuring access to good enough Wi-Fi for virtual consultations and online services and sites that currently don't have them would help with access to healthcare. Um, and a few service users and service providers suggested a women's only clinic for perhaps one day a week um, might make women going in to get healthcare make them feel a bit more comfortable. Um, and again, a great um, positive from the work that's been done the past few months was the interagency collaboration between healthcare, social care and third sector partners. So continuing that moving forward would be great. Thanks for having us. Great, thanks both of you. And you're gonna be around for uh, taking questions uh, later on, I think, that's great. And then we've got our other student group from Edinburgh University, uh, Chiara and Isaac and Jonathan, who are just gonna say a little bit about what they've been doing uh, since COVID. Hi everyone and um, thank you very much John for the introduction and for everyone for having us here today. My name is Chiara, I'm a fifth year medical student as John said from the University of Edinburgh and I'm here presenting today with Isaac and Jonathan on behalf of the Homelessness and Inclusion Health Society. 
Um, so we started up last year as a group of um, students who came together to develop a social impact project around healthcare provision for marginalised members of our community. This started to take shape as the development of a volunteer programme for medical students. The aim of this programme was to strengthen existing services and third sector organisations already working in homelessness and inclusion health, while simultaneously increasing awareness, exposure and experience amongst future doctors. As John said earlier, um, things sort of changed during the COVID pandemic. We had began by volunteering ourselves, trialling outreach shifts with various organisations. But during lockdown, um, we had to change things a little and we recruited, recruited students for the first time to assist at the Edinburgh Access Practice and in the prescription and methadone delivery programmes that were ongoing at the time. Um, at the same time, growing interest in our project led us to found the society that we are speaking on behalf of today. So this autumn we expanded to an 11 person committee um, with roles that oversee volunteering, education and advocacy, publicity and more. Um, we now have over 35 paid student members and are continuing to grow in numbers. Um, with guidance from the Centre of Homelessness and Inclusion Health, Edinburgh Access Practice and uh, the University of Edinburgh Medical School, We've forged partnerships with organizations like Serenians, the Salvation Army, Streetworks, Soul Food, and more to increase volunteering within the medical and student population. Um, on top of volunteering, we are also preparing for our first national student conference on homelessness and inclusion health, and are planning a January long awareness campaign promoting homelessness as a year round problem. Um, importantly, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. There are plenty of brilliant organizations that are working in inclusion health in Edinburgh already. Um, our focus is to bridge the gap locally between the student community and these pre-existing services and more broadly represent and promote a neglected aspect of health education. So looking to the future for the society, um, our ambition is to create a student society with social impact that is active over the long term. Uh, because what we know is this, that students care about the well-being of marginalized communities uh, and they want to help. So to do this, we're pursuing three main goals volunteering, education and advocacy. Um, so development of our volunteering programme is well underway. Uh, students are a motivated resource and we will continue to strengthen our links with existing organisations. The literature shows that healthcare often fails to help those facing issues of drug and alcohol abuse, partially because medical professionals are underexposed and underequipped to provide support for these issues. So we hope that in, in increasing exposure during medical training, we can better equip future doctors to handle these situations and improve the health outcomes of those that often fare the worst. Uh, for education, we have unique access to tomorrow's uh, doctors and nurses, and our hope is that eventually our healthcare volunteering programme could be integrated into the medical curriculum as a formal placement within Edinburgh. Uh, more generally, we want to bring students from different backgrounds together through educational events like our upcoming conference, uh, and to include students in dialogues around health issues like drug misuse. Um, finally, we also want to provide students with the tools for advocacy. Uh, this has already begun as well, uh, with an event happening next January to boost understanding of the Scottish policymaking system. So just to finish off, uh, we are really keen to connect with people from all walks who share the same goals, um, and we would really appreciate any guidance or advice that people would have for us um, as well as to get involved in any existing projects that students could help with. Uh, our contact information was on the slide if anybody was interested in that. Uh, and we can be reached at shihedinburgh at gmail.com. So thanks very much for your time. Well, I, I, I was just going to just finish off by just concluding, but I probably don't need to say much more. Um, just that I, I guess COVID has been a really difficult time for, for many, many people and tragic time for some. Um, but there have been some positive lessons that have come out and some positive developments and we tried to share a few of those today uh, within the university, uh, within a, the, the healthcare setting here in Edinburgh. And I think, you know, what we really hope is we can build on some of these lessons and developments which can have really long term effects in the healthcare we're able to offer those who are the most marginalised. So uh, that's us. Thanks. John, thank you very much indeed. And to Kasia, Aisha, Kiara, Isaac and, and Jonathan, it certainly was very positive and uh, um, I think at these particular challenging times, we, we need that positive outlook. And uh, John, thanks for pulling that all together. Thank you. Uh, our next speakers are uh, John Campbell and Dr. Trina Ritchie. 
NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. So, um, John and Trina, please. Uh, okay, well, I know this is quite a short presentation uh, to look at the harm reduction response from Glasgow during the, the COVID-19 uh, outbreak. But I think whenever you're going to look at drug-related harms in Glasgow, I think it's worthwhile taking a historical look very briefly at drug harms over the past 30, 30 years or so. Uh, in the early 1990s was a time we were becoming increasingly concerned about uh, our overdose rate which now looking back, you know, was much, much smaller than, than it is now. Uh, 1990s were also a time we were very concerned about the outbreak and prevalence of uh, hepatitis C. Uh, at one point that prevalence had peaked at 79% before reducing slightly. Uh, 2000, there were 23 deaths linked to a uh, Clostridium novi. In 2009, there were 14 deaths in Scotland linked to anthrax. Nine of those deaths happened in the Greater Glasgow and Clyde uh, area. 2011, we started to notice uh, new drugs emerge, mainly uh, novel benzodiazepines. The first one we noticed was phenazepam, shortly followed by atizolam and a host of others, brought significant problems with them. In 2014, we had over 30 people hospitalized through botulism, and shortly after that, in 2015, we identified an outbreak of HIV. 47 people uh, uh, HIV positive within 2015, and that's now uh, increased to 187. So we had very significant and, and ongoing problems. And if you ask why has drug-related harm not reduced over the past 30 years? Well, there's a few reasons for that. If you look at the drugs themselves, Drugs have never been cheaper. They have never been easier to get a hold of. There's never been a wider choice of drugs for people to get. And the drugs that are available have never been stronger or more potent. But what about the actual people themselves that they choose? How does that correlate with drug-related harm? Well, for the reasons I mentioned, people are consuming far more drugs. People are injecting far more often if they're injecting cocaine, for example. People tend to inject now in, in smaller groups, so involved in batch batch preparation, bring significant risk of the transmission of blood-borne viruses. Some more transient population, so people moving from area to area, so people dipping their toes, if you like, in very high-risk environments, even for a few weeks, carry significant uh, risks. And we often talk about public injecting scene, which of course is a risk, but people actually injecting away from their home environment uh, is a risk uh, also. Okay, so if that was set in the scene, obviously the COVID and lockdown, uh, lockdown hitting us on the... Lockdown hitting on the 23rd of March. Uh, we were very fortunate in Greater Glasgow and Clyde, over 90% of our IEP outlets remained open. All our IEP outlets in Glasgow City Centre remained open. Uh, the Glasgow Drug Crisis Centre maintained its 24-hour uh, access for both needle exchange and admissions uh, also. Um, there was actually a slight increase in the amount of needles and syringes we provided over the the first lockdown period when you discount those people who would have accessed their service for injecting steroids and other uh, similar similar drugs. And a number of reasons for that, we were encouraging clients to take away as many needles and syringes as possible so that uh, I guess, you know, artificially in increased that. Uh, but yeah, the program retained all the way through that. Uh, unfortunately, the Glasgow Drug Crisis Centre, who would usually staff our mobile IEP van, mobile IEP van was a van that was active in the heart of the city centre in the evening between 6 o'clock and, and 10 o'clock. They could no longer staff that. So within a few days, we had to put together a team of volunteers to keep that service going. Now, this became increasingly important as the homeless population in Glasgow city centre increased and we were housing people in, in hotels. And we were encouraging people, if you like, to actually stay within the confines of that hotel as well. So we quickly put together a team of vol volunteers. We continued that service for the next 49 consecutive nights. The volunteers worked in teams of 
uh, of teams of two. There was no mixing between any of the any of the pairs at all. Uh, no member of staff went down with COVID. No member of staff took any additional time off during this period. Uh, and throughout those 49 consecutive nights, we carried out 518 transactions to 199 individuals, provided over 10,000 uh, needles or sheets of foil, issued 162 naloxone kits, and we also used naloxone six times in people we had found in an overdose state lying in the street. And what we, what we witnessed during those uh, during that period was, was really quite quite harrowing. Um, but I think it's fair to say it was quite humbling for us as well. We frequently witnessed people in distress, been very uh, intoxicated, drug use was, was very open. People were sitting injecting or, or smoking crack, crack cocaine. We wouldn't really have seen that to the same extent before. Uh, the overdose rate initially seemed to increase significantly uh, as well, and we started to see a lot of low-level violence, violence related to, well, probably related to, 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 to drug debts uh, or situational uh, violences as well. What we did also see there was, a, you can see an inflatable unicorn riding a, a bicycle down uh, a Gale Street. That's probably the most bizarre uh, thing we would have witnessed during that. So moving out of lockdown, we, we were aware that we had a lot of people and, you know, sharing uh, hotels together, you know, likely sharing injecting equipment. We were concerned about the prevalence of bloodborne viruses. We were concerned about injecting related uh, complications and, uh, and injuries. Uh, we knew that overdose was consistent throughout this as well. So we had to look at ways to increase bloodborne virus testing. Uh, we had to find a way actually sitting with people and being able to assess and injecting related injuries and other injecting related harm. We had to find a way of trying to get naloxone out there to prevent drug related deaths and try and link as many clients as possible with an alcohol and drug uh, recovery services. And we did this through an initiative, an initiative called WAND. The WAND had been planned before the outbreak of, of COVID, but it was obviously put in the back burner. But this gave us a fantastic opportunity to look at four key interventions that would help us deal with injecting related complications, the drug related deaths and, and the prevalence of bloodborne viruses. And the interventions are a wound care, a comprehensive assessment of injecting risk, the provision of uh, naloxone and uh, frequent dry blood spot testing. So the way the wound initiative works, it's aimed at a city centre injecting uh, population. All our city centre outreach teams are involved in this. It's linked into NEO. NEO is a web-based data collection system for all our injecting equipment providers uh, across the, the board area. So we promote those four interventions. Clients are given a Starbucks-style reward card. When they complete an intervention, it's ticked off, and it's also recorded on NEO. It gives it a date stamp as well. Um, the client has completed those, those four interventions. They're provided with a voucher that they can take to a local shop in exchange for uh, they could top up the mobile phone, you know, top up the utilities or the gas or electric, or they could exchange that, uh, exchange that for, for cash. Uh, they're able to access this intervention or the range of interventions every three to four, four months. Now, three to four months becomes really significant when we're trying to frequently test someone for the prevalence of bloodborne viruses, such as uh, HIV or uh, hepatitis C. The response has been phenomenal. In the first month in September, there were 403 wounds checked through the assessment of injecting risk. Uh, we managed to get 467 naloxone kits out there, and the blood tested 380 individuals. And the reason there were less dry blood spot tests taken than there was uh, assessments of injecting risk is we didn't blood test anyone who we knew to be HIV or HIV positive. Oh, that seems to be a Santa list that's sneaked in there. Okay, thank you. John, 
Many thanks indeed for that. That was uh, fascinating, uh, not least the, the, the history and the previous challenges and how you're dealing with the present ones and six uses of naloxone, certainly life-saving, that's superb. Um, and I'll be on the lookout in Inverness for inflatable unicorns. They're probably more likely to be about here. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Trina Ritchie. Trina, please. I'm afraid I don't have slides today, so you just have to um, bear with me on the screen. Um, thanks very much for the opportunity to speak today. I've been asked to give an insight about the impact of the COVID pandemic for drug treatment services. I am trained as a GP, but for the last 15 years, I've worked in alcohol and drug treatment services in uh, Glasgow and Greater Glasgow and Clyde, which I'm going to talk about. And I'm pretty sure from the um, regular calls that Dave has um, organised and chaired from nationally for treatment services and partners um, during the pandemic that our experiences in Greater Glasgow and Clyde are quite representative of, um, of many areas. So Greater Glasgow and Clyde, I'm sure you know, is um, made up of six HSCP areas with Glasgow being by far the largest in the board area. We have 6,000 people on opioid substitute treatment in specialist services in Greater Glasgow and Clyde and another 2,500 people in OST um, in primary care supported by shared care models. And our uh, you know, um, ISD estimates suggest that there is the same number of people who are not in treatment in Greater Glasgow and Clyde as well um, who have a problem with drug use. So at the beginning of the pandemic, our treatment services had to rapidly transform service delivery. We had a very open door access where people could walk in and drop in to any of our um, services and could also self-refer. And in a very short um, period of time, that in-person contact changed to remote contact and our open door um, was it was very challenging to, to keep some element of, of open door. Weekly and fortnightly clinic consultations changed to mostly telephone based contact to um, reduce the need for people to, to leave their houses. And at the same time, for every individual, there was a risk assessed decision to increase the length of prescription where possible and to reduce pharmacy instalments and supervised consumption. So people changed from going to the community pharmacy daily, maybe five or six times a week to once, twice or, or sometimes three times weekly at the pharmacy. People, as we've heard, people who were shielding or isolating were, and still are, delivered their OST medication and in GGC that has been done by treatment service staff. Um, but from the beginning of the pandemic to now, new patients, people released from prison, people discharged from hospital and other people at risk have been seen regularly in person. And that has uh, been either in the service offices or on outreach visits or home visits. And similarly to Lothian, the homeless addiction team in Glasgow City Centre, due to the higher identified risks for the whole caseload, everyone continued to be seen in person over the period of time. Thinking of all those people who are not in treatment, we really prioritised work which was already established in the city to provide the same day OST start. And again, as we've heard, that was done by outreach visit, also use of taxis when required, um, and provision of daily duty medical or pharmacy prescribers in each area team. And that's gone well, and we continue to visit that um, and, and look at the figures for that. Sometimes it's working better in one part of the city or the other, and really our priority is to ensure um, equal access throughout the city. So with that, since March, we have seen a number of people who have come into treatment in the services who report long-standing um, problem drug use who have never been in treatment before. So that's been really positive to see. The pandemic also gave us the opportunity to prioritise use of injectable buprenorphine in 
Greater Glasgow and Clyde. So Glasgow was the first NHS service in the UK to, to use Buvidal in early 2019. We offered it to 20 people in the south of Glasgow who were already established on buprenorphine tablets. 14 people agreed to try Buvidal. One person quickly decided it wasn't for them and transferred back um, onto buprenorphine tablets. But the other 13 people described it really as life changing and a treatment that they allowed them to take different opportunities, to take overtime at work without worrying about attending the pharmacy. And at six months and 12 months, it showed marked reduction of street drug use and engagement in different structured activities or mental health uh, care plans. So we, sorry, excuse me. <coughs> Um, wrote pandemic guidance and moved to offer uh, Buvidal when possible. We offered it to new patients coming to treatment, um, really with the idea that a monthly injection delivering a treatment dose of buprenorphine every day of the month without people having to leave their home. Uh, we now have over 200 people established in treatment across NHS GGC, mostly in the Glasgow area. And interestingly, we also have 12 people who've completed a planned detox on Buvidal. 10 people remain abstinent. Some of those um, must be approaching six months now of um, abstinent from uh, treatment. Two people have relapsed to opiate use, but very quickly represented for Buvidal treatment. And as they described, had they relapsed and their treatment option was to return to daily pharmacy attendance, that they're not sure that they would have come back into treatment so quickly. So again, that's been a real positive benefit. The Enhanced Drug Treatment Service, which delivers injectable dimorphine treatment, was initially paused at the start of the pandemic when really risks were unquantified and we weren't sure you know, in March and April um, how things were going to be um, affected. And we thought we may need to use the pharmacy dispensary to, um, to dispense OST. But uh, since the early part of the pandemic, the um, EDTS treatment has continued to run and is now recruiting new patients. In all our teams, our multidisciplinary case discussion meetings have very much like this, obviously moved to uh, video calls and they continue weekly in each of the team areas to plan admission to our inpatient and residential services, which are also um, active and have been throughout the pandemic. Um, in terms of street benzodiazepines and our concern about their role in drug related deaths, We've continued during the pandemic to work to our new local treatment guidance um, around considering prescribing interventions. Um, we've also embraced a newly commissioned residential service, which we have in the Glasgow area, where people can stay for up to six weeks to be detoxed from street benzodiazepines, but stabilised um, on their OST treatment. And John's spoken about the ongoing HIV outbreak in Glasgow. Um, in the community teams and throughout the health boards, people were, as he said, tested annually or more frequently as required. And this testing identified um, a quarter of the HIV diagnosis and the outbreak. So the, the effect of our reduced in-person contact and knock-on effect of reduced bloodborne virus testing has been of concern. And we've really been looking at different ways that we can um, maximise testing. We've continued to test anybody who was coming to see us or who was being seen on outreach or home visit by health staff. Um, but that remains an area for us, um, an area of priority for us. I guess for treatment services at this point in the pandemic, I think one of our main challenges is capturing the positive change for each individual. So some people have really embraced the move to telephone contact and their uh, key workers report, you know, much better, um, you know, long conversations, phone conversations, and it's really going very well. And other people absolutely detest phone com consultations or, as we know, they don't have access, ready access to a phone. 
And similarly, many people have found it a very positive step to reduce frequency of community pharmacy attendance. And we certainly have no plans for anyone who hasn't come to harm to, to, um, for them to return to frequent pharmacy attendance. But other people don't like not going to the pharmacy and describe missing the, you know, the daily contact. So balancing, um, capturing the positive changes for each person, but also balancing the numerous risks for each individual. So our staff are continually reviewing risk and, and that informs decisions about care and treatment. But, but we're, there's still an element of unknown in terms of the risks. So there's comorbidity, possibly chest problems, COPD. There's a queue outside a pharmacy in winter, Scottish inclement winter weather. You know, contact with other people versus loneliness of being at home alone and, and no contact. So I think that that's a real challenge, weighing risk and balancing risk and also asking staff to do that by telephone consultation when their uh, skills for many years have been around in-person uh, assessment of, of drug and alcohol use and, and planning care. And so, yeah, gosh, that's quite quick. Sorry. <laughs> that, that's all I really thought of to, to say. I think basically, you know, we want to capture change. There's been a lot of positive change and we don't go, want to necessarily go back to previous models, but we do have quite a lot of um, aspects to look at from treatment service provision. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed, Trina. I've been making notes here. They'll not be as good as the minute, I'm, I'm sure. But uh, for drug treatment services, a, a couple of things I took from that, the injectable uh, bupedal, I think that sounds really uh, very exciting. And the fact that you say that you consider the change for the individuals, because you're right, one person's grim standing in a queue is an opportunity for others to, to actually have some social contact. So it is about what people want. Thanks for all the, the, the work that you do in treatment services. That's much appreciated. Um, uh, and our, our final speaker um, um, is from the Scottish Drugs Forum, last but by no means least, uh, Emma Hamilton. Emma, please. Excellent. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to come and speak today. Um, uh, as mentioned, I'm Emma Hamilton. I'm the Head of Inclusion and Peer Engagement at Scottish Drugs Forum. And along with our partners, um, at uh, the, the um, MRC CSO Social and Public Health Sciences Unit. Um, we've developed and um, facilitated an evaluation across Scotland or certain areas across Scotland looking at the impact, individual impacts of coronavirus and associated responses on people who use or have used substances. And I'm going to give you a very quick whistle, talk, whistle stop tour of some of our findings today. Um, and actually quite <laughs> nicely, um, they match quite a lot of the findings of all the other presentations you've had today. So it's a really good mixture of presentations, I think, to highlight some of the key points. So um, there, I just thought I'd give some key elements of the methods today. I didn't want to focus a lot of it because we'll focus on the findings, but just to let people know that we applied for and were granted ethical approval to, uh, to undertake this work that it's facilitated by Scottish Drugs Forum's peer research volunteers. And because of the scaling down or closing of services, recruitment was via their network initially before it rolled out further. And to ensure that we had certain safety measures in place, we developed a three-way calling system. So that was where the, the Scottish Drugs Forum User Involvement Development Officer would also be on the call, not to engage in the interview, but to describe the uh, describe the conversation and also to keep note of any changes in the individual's um, capacity to offer ongoing consent through the, the, the um, interview because we're very conscious of our duty to ensure um, capacity to consent. Um, so who are our participants? We have to date 79 participants in total and this work is ongoing. Um, of the participants, 46 were male and 33 were female, and the age range was from 25 to 68. Of those individuals, 41 people state that they still actively use substances, and 30 say they still actively use alcohol problematically. Um, and a few of those individuals used, used both, and some of the, the sample also used nothing and were ongoing in treatment. The majority of participants lived by themselves um, in their own tenancy, either a, a social let um, or owned tenancy in some cases. 
um, and the majority lived by themselves, but we did have people who, who lived with their children, lived with partners or lived with other family members. To date, we have um, carried out data collection in four local authority areas um, and covered a range of rural, semi-rural and urban populations. Um, and we do have plans to do um, data collection in a number of local authority areas over and above what we've done already. And if we are to get more funding for this, then we hope to roll it out across Scotland to get a real representative, rep representative picture. So, this, the slide that you see here is one individual's social circle, if you like. The individual being at the, the middle of the, the circle there. Um, I'm just showing this as a representation of the, the things that we're capturing. So the, the circles in yellow there um, and closer to the individual at the centre demonstrate those changes that people perceive to have been positive in, in light of the, the coronavirus lockdown or further restriction measures. So this person's um, voted uh, or suggested that their methadone, their changing in their methadone dispensing was wholly positive as a result of lockdown. And also that their physical activity was a positive change because they were more able to go dog walking or do some gardening. On the flip side of that, and you look at the, the two red circles above, the further away they are um, indicates that it was a negative, um, uh, a negative, they perceived that change as a negative. And the, the negative change was access to their addiction service and the support they received from their psychiatric nurse. So this gives you a sort of social indication of the interactions that people have had during lockdown and whether they're perceived as positive or negative. Um, I'll just quickly go through a couple of points of this. Um, this uh, gives uh, an estimated rating of each social contact compared to the overall average. The wider the arms um, on either side of the dot is sort of the confidence interval. So the wider they are, there is a wider margin of error. So that's something to bear in mind with, with these um, findings at the moment. So the dot in, the, dot in each uh, line is the, the point estimate. Um, so the point estimates in blue on the right side of the zero line demonstrate a positive interaction since lockdown and the, the dot estimates in red on the left indicate a negative interaction. So you can see here that friends, which is second from the bottom, its point estimate is on the negative side of the scale and the confidence intervals are more narrow than others, but also all fall into the negative side of um, the, the scale. So this demonstrates and we can say with quite a lot of confidence that the people have rated that their interactions with friends certainly over this period have um, changed to a negative. Um, equally, at the very top, you can see that people's uh, estimation of the change for the pharmacy is more positive. People have rated this change as more positive and that can, we can see that with a, a high degree of certainty across the full sample. So those are some of the quantitative ways that we demonstrate the, the findings, but actually what I'm going to discuss to you, with you in more detail is the qualitative findings we've found. Um, so these are the main themes that we extracted from the data um, thus far. So there is a varied experience, the reactions to service changes differ, lack of control, choice or communication, uh, lack of support or communication related to other health needs instead of only addiction, no real concern for themselves with regards to COVID, um, information around substance use as a supply and a big one about social isolation and loneliness which Trina picked up on earlier as well so that, that's really good to see. So very quickly on the variation of experience it's worth bearing in mind that this covers four local authority areas and the experience in each area does differ and it could be that we just got a really happy sample in one area and quite negative sample in the other but actually um, it, yeah it, it's it, the, there's different service changes, so um, people respond to those different service changes in those different areas. Um, people have very different reactions to um, the, the service changes that happen. So as Trina mentioned around phone support, some people love it, some people hate it. So it's worth bearing in mind that the variation of experience differs and that therefore the impact of those changes also differs between individuals. 
So some of the, the main ones, and Trina mentioned earlier around the telephone support, and we probably had the same picture there as well. So some people much preferred it. They much preferred not having to go to a service, much preferred not having to engage with others around about a service. They found it much easier to access and therefore much better to engage with. Um, and we heard people who um, have engaged with addiction services now where they hadn't engaged previously. And that's a result of this sort of um, at a distance support. It didn't feel as overwhelming. Other people really disliked phone support. And the, the thing that they, comes across is that they miss the face-to-face -face interaction. They think it's impersonal. They also said it was much easier to lie about how they were feeling, saying, I'm fine and yeah, my drug use is fine. Um, they also mentioned that they find it really difficult to proactively engage with services when it's telephone support because A, they might not have money in their phone to be able to phone the service, or if they do, or if it's a free phone number, then the number is always engaged. There was quite a lot of concern around the telephone support and especially around missing phones from their missing phone calls from their addiction worker because there was a bit of a fear around well if i miss this call does that mean my prescription is going to get stopped so that definitely um came out of the data as well one of the the best things here was the the dispensing arrangements an overwhelming majority viewed the changes to their dispensing arrangements as wholly positive. They much preferred the, them having to visit the pharmacy less to pick up their opioid replacement therapy. And in the majority of cases, it was methadone that we've managed to capture so far. They said they were at much less risk of relapse or um, continued or uh, continued drug use as not having to attend the pharmacy every day and therefore less contact with dealers and um, their drug using friends. Um, they also felt empowered to manage their own medication. So these were very clear findings that came out of the data. The only concerns that came out of the dispensing changes was that um, the possibility for diversion of medication either by choice or by coercion. Um, and a very few men, people mentioned, but it was mentioned that the, the increased level of overdose risk for some. Um, there was a real sense of fear that came out of the data around um, once COVID's done with pharmacies and dispensing returning to a daily um, dispensing, um, which we have noted to be the case in some areas since restriction levels have um, reduced. Other things that people noted was queuing outside of pharmacies and what that meant in terms of stigma. Some people found that it had, they felt much less stigmatized because everybody now has to queue in a pharmacy. Others felt much more stigmatized because everybody knows what I'm there for when I'm queuing in a pharmacy. So it's an interesting, I think it pulls at that variation of experience and demonstrates that quite nicely. I think something that really, really comes out of the data is around the, the, the lifeline of um, peer support via vir virtual meetings. It, it was overwhelming the amount of people that like, say that that's really helped them, that it's pulled them through the darkest times, that even though they're lonely and socially isolated, that this is one thing that they look forward to and can keep in touch with which is all fine and well, unless you're digitally excluded. So there's a real cohort of individuals that are really not getting support from services or peers. So that's something to bear in mind as we go forward as well. Now, there was a lack of support or communication related to other health needs. And it, this went across a number of health disciplines, but the thing that came across most strongly was around mental health provision. So it really came across that there was a lack of access to mental health support. Most report having no support or very limited contact from mental health services, despite getting support previous to um, coronavirus. People really feel let down by services with regards to their mental health support. And although this wasn't universal, it really was highlighted by the majority. And many people um, reported that their mental health has declined um, as a result of coronavirus and restriction measures. People reported having much worse mental health now than pre-COVID. 
and some had real mental health emergencies and episodes of crisis, including attempts on their lives. Must say, at those points, people did say that the services did respond in these emergencies. Participants attribute their decline in mental health to lack of face-to-face -face engagement, being indoors all the time, being socially isolated, feeling lonely and missing friends and family. And a lot of people talk around missing like touch and hugs. There's also a real anxiety around the changes to service and what that will mean long term, and also having a lack of control around things in their life. Um, just very quickly, um, around COVID, there really wasn't a, a concern around individuals and their uh, thoughts around getting COVID, but their concern lay with friends or family members getting COVID. Um, there was real confusion around guidelines um, and what the restrictions meant. Um, but what did come across is that people tended to socially distance with family members, but not, not so or less so with friends. And they were really worried about what would happen to services that have closed down and um, that they used to access previous to coronavirus lockdown and whether they would still be in place once things become more normal. So very quickly around substance use, what we found is that there's been really no change um, to the supply of drugs people were using. There was a real concern at the start that there was going to be a dry up. And as such, dealers were encouraging people to bulk buy. Um, however, availability has not really changed other than small amounts of people noticing there's an increase in methadone about and less cannabis to buy. Um, qualities stayed roughly about the same. Some changes noted, for example, lower, uh, lower quality, higher priced heroin and cannabis being mixed with um, new psychoactive substances but really nothing strong coming from the data there. People say their use has increased um, and of those who were already using prior to lockdown. There has been some cases of relapse um, and the increased use or relapse have been explained by people's decline in mental health and boredom and lack of support available. Also, um, they were talking about some house parties that they'd heard of and how the substances were readily available at the parties and there was no social distancing at those places. So social isolation and loneliness. Um, people described a sudden and massive change to their social network um, and support network due to coronavirus. The, there were reduced services, no face-to-face, -face, a complete contraction of support. Um, their network, uh, changed in that they were not able to engage with friends and family members. There was a real fear around passing COVID on to loved ones. Um, people were expending extended periods at home with little or no distraction and es especially bad for people who were digitally excluded. Um, the activities people prior to COVID described having um, lives full of activities or at least some, for example, volunteering or going to um, various um, you know, Narcotics Anonymous, Alcoholics Anonymous, different peer support meetings and mutual aid meetings. And those changed, maybe they went virtually, but a lot of them stopped, um, certainly some of the local volunteering. And so people's activities reduced um, massively. And everybody mentioned that all of this social isolation, this loneliness um, added to their, their, their decline in mental health and increased substance use. So as I said, a very whistle-stop tour. And if you do have any questions, please get in touch. Uh, but thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for listening to this. Emma, thank you very much indeed. Uh, a whistle-stop tour, but a, a huge amount of work there. And um, I think you've mentioned it twice about digital exclusion. And uh, we've all become very familiar with this. And uh, you know, uh, the decline in mental health support combined with that, we need to, uh, I think as parliamentarians, be very aware of that because whilst there's huge benefits, not least in attendance numbers at this particular group too, um, you know, it, it, it's not for everyone. Uh, well, that's, we've heard from our speakers on the impact of COVID on people with drug problems, isn't the services providing them? I think they've been outstandingly informative and um, I'm very grateful to everyone for that.